We've all heard about the Titanic and its famous story. Those of us who like ocean liners also know about other famous ships like the RMS Queen Mary, RMS Oceanic, SS Rex, and a few others. Ocean liners were the cruise ships of the 19th and 20th centuries, but few people today know what they are. Here's a short story about what ocean liners are and why they're almost extinct. Before steamships were used by a lot of people, people traveled and moved to new places on masted sailing ships. The trips often took more than a month and were so dangerous that there was a good chance you would never get where you were going. However, many people were willing to take that risk. In order to build a steamship company that could carry passengers in speed and safety, Samuel Cunard intended to use steam technology. He wanted more people to be able to travel by ocean, and he also had a dream of establishing a regular crossing from Europe to the United States. Before that, there were no regular crossings. You had to book the first sailing ship that was open, and only God knew when you would arrive. Samuel Cunard started Cunard Steamships Limited, and in 1840, the Britannia, a steam-powered ocean liner, was the company's first ship. In the event of an emergency, a paddle heeler with sailing masts. The fastest sailing ship journey took 12 days and 10 hours to complete its crossing from Liverpool, England to Halifax, Nova Scotia. The success of steamship technology led to a shipbuilding boom, with new shipping companies starting and establishing themselves with new fleets of ships. The White Star Line would become Cunard's biggest foe on the Atlantic. Rivalries were no longer just about speed and safety, but also about luxury. At the end of the Victorian era, ships were built quickly that were bigger, faster, and more luxurious. Whether it was raining or sunny, all of them were intended to transport passengers across the seas to their destinations. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, steamship passengers only went on trips when they had to. Most working-class people couldn't afford to go on vacations yet, so no one got on an ocean liner to have fun. In fact, most passengers didn't like being out at sea. They didn't like how the ships rolled in the water or how rough and nasty the storms were. Part of the luxury of being on an ocean liner was that they were finally built to be like the best hotels on land, with all the interiors designed to distract you from the fact that you were out at sea. Notice that these early ocean liners didn't have large windows or balconies with views of the ocean. If you go to the Queen Mary, for instance, you'll see that even in the 1930s, the ship's public rooms only had windows for light, but the portholes and windows were often covered with frosted glass or even curtains that let light in but blocked views of the ocean. Despite the fact that ocean liners were not built for cruising in year, the entertainment part of these ships became more and more important over time. People didn't want to be stuck in their staterooms for the whole trip, so ships often gave out daily programs that listed the entertainment options. Often, the ship's band played classical music, and later, ships like the Queen Mary had movie theaters where people could watch the latest movies. The number of passengers that steamships were carrying steadily fell as a result of the United States' stricter immigration policies in the early 20th century. But in the 1920s, pleasure travel quickly made up for that drop. Tourism was on the rise, and more and more people were crossing seas to visit other countries. The ships themselves were not considered the trip's feature, but even so, ocean liners were just a means of transportation. At least not until the United States had a law against drinking. Laws were passed that made it illegal to sell and drink alcohol, so many Americans went on booze cruises that took them out to foreign waters where they could drink and meet new people. In this instance, the ship itself was the reason for booking a trip, which is how the cruise ship came into existence. The first cruise ships weren't built just for cruising. Instead, they were made up of fleets of old ocean liners. Ocean liners did have the same problem as time capsules, not just in terms of form and style, but also in terms of technology. As newer, fancier ocean liners raced across the seas, the older, smaller ones couldn't keep up. If they hadn't been saved, they would have been broken up. So living a few more years and running boost trips may not have been a dignified way to end your life, but at least it wasn't a quick death. Commercial flights across the Atlantic couldn't compete with ocean liners until the early 1950s, when jet engines were finally put into large, mass-produced planes. Larger ships could carry more people, and they could cross the ocean on the same day they took off. This became a big selling point for air travel, 
since most people who took ocean liners did so because they had to, not because they wanted to. So if you could take a one-day flight instead of a four-day trip for much less money, why wouldn't you? The ocean liner business went down quickly and in a big way. The older ships were the first ones to leave. Only the ships that were newer and used less fuel stayed in service. Ships like the SS United States were still sleek and stylish, and their state-of-the-art steam engines helped them make money even though the number of passengers was going down. Ironically, the RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth were two of the oldest ships still operating in the late 1960s. This was due to the fact that despite their deteriorating Art Deco design, they were still considered fast and elegant. And the wealthy older people they attracted weren't used to flying by plane, so they still chose to travel across the Atlantic. The two queens finally fell because of the costs that came with being so big. Both ships were too large to fit through the Panama Canal, which limited their ability to sail to more profitable seas. They also needed more and more maintenance, and their older boilers weren't efficient enough to make sailing with so few passengers worthwhile. Cunard got rid of the two queens and replaced them with the newer RMS Queen Elizabeth II, or QE2, a ship with the most efficient steam turbine technology ever put on an ocean liner. Her large staterooms and powerful air conditioning systems made her capable of sailing any ocean on the planet while keeping her passengers comfortable. Last but not least, her slightly shallower draft gave her the ability to sail into tropical ports, allowing her to spend some of the year as a cruise ship. Her slightly smaller size also allowed her to sail through not only the Panama Canal, but also the Suez Canal, increasing the efficiency and speed of her voyages. Although she was designed to sail the roughest North Atlantic weather, she was still considered an ocean liner. In the 1980s and 1990s, cruise ships kept getting more and more famous. Instead of using old ocean liners, the industry started making its own ships. They were a lot like big hotel resorts with decks and swimming pools outside, because most of their voyages were along shallower coastlines and docked in tropical or mild weather areas, cruise ships didn't need to be built for sailing in the roughest of weather. Cruise ships are also part of the experience of going somewhere, so they didn't need the fastest engines because they weren't in a hurry to get anywhere. Even today, the Titanic would still be faster than most modern cruise ships and able to withstand rougher weather than they could. Ocean liners like the QE2 were built with thicker hull plates and stronger decks to withstand those 70-foot ocean swells, whereas cruise ships try to sail around big storms. By the early 2000s, the QE2 was the only ocean liner still in service. She was still making her yearly crossings across the Atlantic, but she was also starting to show her age. In 2004, she was replaced by the Queen Mary II. The QM2 may look like a normal cruise ship, but she is actually an ocean liner. This is clear not only from her sturdy design, but also from her long bow and narrow width. The Queen Mary II does a transatlantic run every year, carrying on the custom of her predecessors, which dates back almost 200 years, in addition to cruising the majority of the year. She is the last ocean liner that is still in use, and she may end up being the last one ever built. The ocean liner legacy, as we know it starts and ends with Cunard, from the Britannia in the year 1840 to the Queen Mary II in the year 2000.